Okay, good morning everybody. I hope everybody's having a wonderful day. So today I'm going to be talking more about graph traversal algorithms. In particular, I'm going to start off by coming back to DFS and talking about a couple more things we can do with DFS at least, and a couple properties that DFS has. Then we'll be talking about breadth for search, which is another, or what they call BFS. Uh, they, um, these are in fact going to be two different graph traversal algorithms that like I'm going to show you today, they very often operate like literally like an algorithm, which they are, but they also serve really nicely as a design, a thing that I can use to set up designing other algorithms to solve other problems by simply just changing around how the graph traversal does certain operations. For example, we have marking vertices and labeling edges. So I'm going to show you that you can make very small modifications to DFS or BFS, uh, as I'm going to talk about later, uh, and these will, in fact, allow you to solve other problems. So you can look at sort of like, now I don't mean this in the literal software engineering sense, but you could view like DFS and BFS like a design pattern where you can simply modify, make small modifications to it to solve other graph theoretic problems. So a lot of problems on graphs can be actually solved just using gra variants of DFS and BFS. So I want to show you some examples of these, and I might get you to see a couple more examples when you're doing your next assignment. So the first one I want to talk about is pathfinding. So this is one that you will encounter very often in practice if you're doing things with networks or graphs, is suppose I have some graph here, and I would like to be able to tell you, hey, look, I want to find a path from, say, vertex A, to say vertex E. So a path that gets me from S to T is what we call an ST path. So our goal here is to compute an ST path. So to make this a little easier for me to set up and show you kind of the similarities between DFS and how we going to, we're going to approach this, I'm going to assume that P is some global verb. I would not recommend doing this in general OO practices. But you could just treat it as an instance variable. That's how you would typically use it. So you just have some instance variable, you make it private, and you have some stack that you can make modifications to. So you initialize it with your object or your graph, however you might use it. But I'm just going to assume it's just some global variable to make this a little easier to illustrate for you. Is that clear, everybody? So I'm not telling you don't <laughs> make sure you, you take good advantage of, of the practices of OO, okay? <laughs> Sometimes it makes sense to use global variables, I'm just doing it for pedagogical reasons here. So reasons I want to just show you it. Okay, so when I'm doing this, so first I want to just point over there and then we're going to do an example, is I want to take advantage of the fact I have this stack. Now remember in DFS, I, had a, I used the call stack and that call stack is what I take advantage of to keep traversing through the graph. Remember all I do is I mark a vertex and then I consider all the edges that are incident on my vertex that are not labeled. So when I do this, I look at the endpoint, I say, hey, look, is, it, is the other endpoint marked or not? If it isn't marked, then most certainly I haven't been there yet. <laughs> so that means I better label some stuff to get me a little further. Now, the great thing about this is when I'm trying to compute a path, do I really need to be labeling edges? Do I need to know anything about these edges? Not really, no. No, I don't need any special information about, about that. So all I need really is the information about the vertices. I want to make sure I don't revisit a vertex again, right? So I'm going to modify DFS so that I'm not accounting for those edge labelings. I'm just going to care about it whether I visited a vertex or I don't visit a vertex. But also, I want to make sure that if I find a path, I want to take advantage of the recursion to tell me, hey, look, I found a vertex. Let's, let's stop this process, okay? So we're going to be storing this stack P so that when I look at the stack, we're going to see in our example how this is going to work. So the stack is going to keep track of this path for us. So here's the idea. So I'm going to start off by marking, just like I did in DFS. Then I'm going to push the vertex S. This is going to always be 
where I have my start vertex. But remember, I'm gonna be employing recursion, so it's gonna be each vertex I'm going to encounter along potential paths. So I'm gonna be trying to find this path. And now naturally, if S is equal to T, meaning that they're the same vertex, I'm going to return true. So you'll notice that my output, it's a little bit different from what you'd expect. You can always change this so that it's literally returning a path. But I'm just gonna say true if there's an ST path and false otherwise. I'm just gonna assume that this, this stack P is gonna store the path for me. But you can easily modify this so that it actually does just return the path itself. So the same setup very much. I just really wanna make sure I'm clear that you should see the pattern of DFS hiding in this. So I mark the vertex, I push, I push S, and then I go through if I don't have it where they're gonna be matching, I'm gonna go through all my instant edges and I'm just gonna see if the other endpoint isn't marked. If it isn't marked, then I'm gonna call recursively pathfind where I'm going to give it the opposing endpoint as the new start vertex. So I'm just going to extend this path by one and then I'm going to see if I can find a path from that vertex to T. And if this returns true, then I'm gonna return true overall. Now, of course, there's a possibility I can hit a dead end somewhere on my path finding over here. So if I fail to find any path along this process, I need some way to unwind those mistakes that I made. So what I'm going to do is if that happens, I'm going to pop the stack. So that's the same way I, remember I was, I was Theseus the other day, I don't look very nice like Theseus does, <laughs> but the point is, is that I would unwind my string, right? So this is just very much the same idea, except I'm just talking about the path itself, not just the recursion. And of course, if I unwind, then most certainly I didn't find a path. It means I hit a dead end. So I'm going to just return false in that case. So that just means it's just gonna try another incident edge from a recursive standpoint. And of course, if I fail to find one over all of the possible pathways I could probably look at, it most certainly will return false. So, the big thing I want you to observe, how similar that is to DFS, all I've done is made a few small modifications to it, but it just has the same idea. I mark a vertex, then I consider all my incident edges, and then I do some things with that. So I wanna do an example with you. So imagine I wanna find this ST path. So you already can see it right here, it's A, B, C, and E. But let me just walk through this process. So the first thing I should do is I always mark the vertex, and then I'm gonna push S onto the stack. So A is gonna go on the stack. And then what I need to do is I need to consider, okay, S, well, obviously S is not equal to T, so we're gonna enter into here. And then I'm gonna consider all my incident edges where one endpoint's S, in this case, that means it's A. The other endpoint is going to end up being whatever the endpoint of the incident edge is. In this case, I only have one. So notice that I'm gonna be going and trying out pathfind where I give the new start vertex is going to be B, and then I'm gonna pass along T. So that means I'm gonna recursively apply pathfind. So what does that mean? I'm gonna mark B, I'm going to push B. So, so far we're right about here. So keep that in mind as we're doing this. I did the same process I just did a moment ago. Well, obviously S is not equal to T, so I'm gonna to have to consider all my incident edges. Now, suppose I were to go to D instead of C here, because obviously D isn't marked, right? So I can most certainly, my algorithm could go that way, right? So I'm just going to do the same process. So I'm gonna mark D, I'm going to push D, and then I look at all my incident edges. Okay, well, clearly D is not equal to T, so, well, T in this case is E, of course. So notice I look at all my incident edges and I say, uh-oh, I don't have any other incident edges that aren't where the other endpoint isn't marked, right? So what do I do? I pop. <laughs> so I didn't find a path. So I'm gonna have to consider another incident edge for B. So I'm going to pop. And this is when I would return false. So now I'm not gonna be going that way anymore. So now I need to consider Another incident edge, remember I'm back over here where I'm considering vertex B. And now I'm gonna call this on another incident edge that, that isn't marked. Sorry, where the endpoint of that incident edge isn't marked. We have to always be careful with these things. And notice it's C right here. 
So I'm going to consider C. I'm going to call that with pathfind. I'm going to push C after I marked it. Then I consider all my incident edges. So I look at each instant edge, it's opposing endpoint. Okay, well, that one's marked, so I'm not gonna consider that one. However, this one is not marked, so I'm going to go over there. But look, but look, 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 look. Now, if I consider E, I'm going to mark E, I'm going to push E, and then I check, oh, is S equal to T? Well, now remember, S now is E. T is equal to T, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's indeed the exact same fault, in fact, Sorry, it's E is equal to T, so it most certainly will be the case that it's going to return true. So that means when I return true here, you'll notice that in my terms of my recursion, when I check this condition, which is what where my recursive call happens, it checks if it's true, and then it will return true. And then if you're thinking about the way we did DFS before, it's just our, our call stack is going to just every single time it's going to say, okay, return true. Okay, that one returned true, so I'm going to return true. And it's going to work its way all the way back to A, and it'll return true overall. Now, you might ask, where is the ST path? Well, if you read this carefully, if you take a look at this, there's your ST path right there. So it's sitting right there in the stack. So you could use do whatever you like with it. If you wanted to pop off all of these and put them into some data structure, you could use that. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of ways you can modify this further. But does everybody understand how I'm doing this pathfinding? So here's a classic way you can use a stack in combination with DFS to compute a ST path. So are there any questions about this pathfinding algorithm and how we did this? So I encourage you, so this is just a little exercise I encourage you to do, is try to find a path from A to F. Now, we can see that there is no path there, but I want you to think about what the stack should look like when, at the end of this process, what the stack will end up looking like. I'll let you think about that, okay? Ah, what, would the pop, PPOP return false be inside the loop. So we need it to be outside the loop because we have to consider all of our incident edges first before we can say, hey, look, I didn't find any path. That's why we need to consider all the incident edges first. So remember, we pop when we hit, we don't find a path. Now remember, it is just applying this recursively, right? So, so remember, when I call path find, say for example on B. So when I called it on B, whatever the result of this is, so it either will return true or false. If it returns true at B, this will return back me a result for path find BT, right? And if it's true here, it'll return true and it'll keep working its way up, right? If it returns false, then most certainly this will not satisfy this if statement, and then you'll have to check another incident edge. Ah, so, so a question, so, but yeah, so that's why you have to consider all the incident edges before you pop. It's because I need to make sure I consider all possible incident edges, because there might exist an actual path from S to T through that vertex. Okay, what if there is one more node connected to D? Yeah, you would push that, you would, it would walk you down another way down and you'd push it onto the stack and then you would just try every incident edge and you'd find you won't find any more that you can, you can consider on incident edges and it would pop it right off again after. Ah, but it doesn't look like it happens and that look like the recursion happens again after it is popped, pop D. So remember, if we're considering D here, for example, we don't want to consider any more recursion, right? Because we hit a dead end. There is no path from D to E, right? We considered all of the endpoints that are adjacent to D. That's why we return false, and that's why we pop, is that we want to make sure that we most certainly do not want to consider anything further at D because we've Notice, remember, at that stage, B was already marked. So if I were to consider all of my incident edges, I don't have any that aren't 
like where the other endpoint isn't marked, right? So most certainly I would not want to run any more recursion here uh, on at least when it comes to D because there aren't any incident edges where the other endpoint was not marked. Ah, so if, if we end after D, we start from eight? No, 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 that, no, no, that's very, that's pretty, that, that you're, so think about this, remember, when I, so I wanna think about the call stack. Remember, there's an actual call stack that's being used when I do the recursion here. No, I really appreciate these questions because they're really helpful. I'm sure other students will appreciate this. So I appreciate this question. So when I start up Pathfind ST, so remember, I do this at vertex A. So this is where I'm going to have S being A and the end, that T being E. So I push that onto the call. That's the initial call for Pathfind. And then what I do is I, I end up pushing onto this call stack BE, where, sorry, Remember, there's a whole bunch of other information in this. This is an activation record I'm drawing here. But I just care about the parameters just for our sake for visualizing this. So now I'm on B, E. Now notice that I took, I went to D, right? So I would check D, E. But notice in my example here, notice that I don't find anything, so I popped a D on my stack and I returned false. But when I return false, What happens? Well, I still, I, I, my next, I, I still have on the call stack BE before I can go back to A, right? So notice that I'm still in the routine Pathfind BE. So that means I'm gonna have to consider more incident edges. So as far as it's concerned, it just failed one iteration of this loop for Pathfind BE. So when I return, remember, that's just for one call of the, this recursion. Since we have this buried in the loop, if I fail to, to meet this condition, then as far as it's concerned, okay, well, it didn't run this if statement. Then since this is done executing inside of here, I could do one more iteration again. And I'll keep doing this until I consider all the incident edges. Does that clarify that? So that's why we don't start at A. It's because we to get to calling DE for Pathfind, we had to have been in Pathfind BE for our recursion. So this part is just exactly like DFS. The only difference now is I have this stack that I'm using to keep track of information. Uh, so how would the next call occur? Okay. So no, notice that when I popped and I returned false for D, so that means I'm done with Pathfind DE. So now we don't need to go there anymore because remember, I've already marked that. So we know it's not gonna get invoked again. So since this is marked, at that time C wasn't marked. So I consider another incident edge. Notice that I obviously can't go back to A, right? A is already marked. So I would go to indeed uh, consider Pathfind CE. So that would be the next recursive call. Is Pathfind CE. And from there, that's when our process is going to continue. Notice that, remember, this, this node is already marked. So I most certainly am only going to consider that one right there. Because remember, that's what my loop does. It considers all the incident edges. So if you were to keep doing this, you'd end up with with EE next, and then that's when I returned true. So when I return true here, that gets passed along back to when, when I was in Pathfind CE, when I called Pathfind EE. And since that is true, it matches here and it returns true here. So this is gone. This will return true for Pathfind CE. That will return true. Whoops, we don't have to D, not the DE, the BE. So when I do Pathfind BE, since Pathfind CE returned true, that means it's going to return true as well. So it's going to now pass along that there and I return true. And then this comparison that happened at that point, at that time, 
it will ret fact return true, making this whole statement true. And then I return true again, meaning that the whole process is going to return true like this. So just remember, there's a still, when we use recursion, there's still this call stack. So this call stack plays a very important role in the recursion. So it's not that we unwind the whole process. Remember, I recursively apply pathfind right here. So that's the recursive call. Notice it's in the if statement. I know usually you don't really see recursive calls in if statements, but it is something you could do. Does that clarify it for you? Don't, don't be shy to ask more questions. I want to make sure that you understand this. Ah, so calling D to how going back to B. Okay, so remember, when I... Suppose I'm considering pathfind DE. Remember, it marks D, pushes D onto the stack. So remember, I'm talking about the data structure over there, P, when I do this. And then I consider all my incident edges. So I could, in this case, I would consider this one edge here. And then I check, okay, is U marked or not? Well, if it isn't marked, then that's the only time I apply pathfind, right? That's the only time I apply pathfind. So that means that since B is already marked, I'm most certainly not going to call pathfind because it's that, that U isn't, is indeed marked, right? But that's the only incident edge I have. So I would finish this for loop, then I would pop D right off that stack over there, and then I would return false. But as far as we're concerned from the recursion standpoint, when we popped off D off of here, when I return false after this, path DE is finished. But how did I call path DE? It was from path BE, right? So as far as, so we go back to path BE, where this is when the recursion happened. It was right here and it said, okay, well pathfind DE was false. So now I go through one more iteration of this one more time. And you'll notice that that's gonna find the C and that's where it keeps going along in our search for the path. Does that clarify that for you? Yeah, don't, don't be shy about these things. I, I really appreciate these kind of questions. But yeah, it all comes down to the call stack. So remember, every time I make a recursive call, it creates an activation record. It's going to go on to this call stack. So if you ever lose track of where things are, just draw yourself a little picture off to the side like this, and it often will make things a little easier to keep track of. No, wonderful questions. Wonderful questions. Ah! So wonderful question about this. Notice every one of these, I've just made a slight tweak to DFS. <laughs> so everything I've just described here runs in the exact same time complexities as DFS did last day. So you're gonna notice that none of these I'm gonna talk about their time complexity analyses because all I'm doing is I'm modifying DFS. So the one thing I wanna point out is that push, this push operation can take constant time, this pop can take constant time. So there's nothing really anything new that I'm doing here, except I've just placed this if statement having the recursive call as opposed to just calling it directly. And I don't have to label any edges too. So it's, it's uh, but yeah, it does run in, so when it comes to, to the running time, so remember it's based on if it's an adjacency matrix or an adjacency list for the representation. Remember an adjacency list, we said that the running time is big O of N plus M, where M is the number of edges, N is the number of vertices. And for an adjacency matrix, it's big O of N squared. Because remember, I have the N by N matrix. But like I said, you can recast it in terms of N and M if you really need to. But yeah, no, wonderful questions. So that's the first thing I really wanted to talk to you about was Pathfinding. This is something that you will definitely encounter in practice, and it most certainly is something that you can optimize beyond what I've shown you here. So there's a lot of different ways that you can modify this pathfinding approach. Wonderful. So the next one I want to show you is how we can take vertices and count them. So I'm going to... Now notice last time I didn't really care about labeling the edges. I could take this a little further if I needed to, where 
notice that whenever we visit a vertex to do some operation, I only do it once. That's only when that vertex is unmarked. So that's, so when I visit it, it's when I mark the vertex, right? That's what I do whenever I encounter a vertex in DFS that for the very first time. I mark it and then I do some stuff, right? Well, I gotta take advantage of this fact to count the number of reachable vertices from some vertex U. So, for example, here, here's a fun picture. It's quite similar to the graph I had over there. It just doesn't have that one, what we call an isolated vertex. It means it has degree zero. It just kind of sits on its own. It's, it's quite lonely. We want to make sure we give those vertices a big hug. So, so imagine I have this here. You would tell me, okay, well, how many vertices are reachable from you here? Can somebody tell me how many vertices are reachable, including A itself? How many are reachable here from you? Yeah, there's five. One, two, three, four, five. There's five of them. So we can take advantage of DFS to quickly come up with an algorithm to do this. And there's very simple ways to modify what I've done here. So say, for example, instead you want to count edges as opposed to vertices, you could use a lot of the ideas I've just presented here, except you just care about the vertices. And when you mark them versus not marking them versus the edges, when you label them, when you don't label them. So I just wanted to show you this one. So here's an example of how I, would, I could do this using, D, uh, using as a template DFS. So remember, I always mark the vertex. I'm going to have some counter variable. I'll call it count. I start that at one because I want to make sure I include myself whenever I include it in the count. And then I consider all my incident edges. If I find another endpoint on one of these incident edges is not marked, then I apply count vert recursively, meaning that takes me to the next vertex, just like when I did pathfind over here. And then I'm going to just include its count with my count so far. And then I just simply return the count after I'm done looking at all my incident, well, all the incident edges. So believe it or not, like I said, notice I've all I've done is made some small tweaks to DFS. In fact, in this case, I removed a whole bunch of stuff from DFS. Um, instead, I just care about labeling, uh, sorry, marking vertices and just keeping some basic count and storing that and taking and keeping track of that. It only takes constant time, right? So this will not affect any of the time complexities that I have right here. So everything I said last day about DFS should apply just perfectly fine over here. Is that kind of neat? So any questions about this other application? So this is another way you could take DFS. You can count stuff in the graph. So sometimes people might want to be interested in certain parts of the graph or say, for example, some, some vertex has some certain property and you want to make sure you count all of the ones that have a certain property. You could take this idea and extend it ever so slightly by adding maybe an if statement or some, some small tweak to it. But yeah, no, it's a, it's a pretty neat little application. Ah, so what if when the graph is not connected? Now, remember, all this does, remember, all this does is count the vertices that are reachable from it, right? So what you would have to do to make this work so that you count all of the vertices. So in another way you can think of this as visiting all the vertices is you would have to take the idea I just mentioned last day. I have it in the notes if you're curious about looking at it in more detail. I showed you how in the notes, it's in the notes more detail, but I briefly explained it up uh, verbally last day, was that you could basically take DFS and you could just keep running it over and over again on vertices that aren't marked. So what you do is you have this driver method or driver function, whatever paradigm you're using. I would assume it's probably a method. And you would have DFS and you give it the graph. So what you do is you'd have an actual loop that just goes through each of the vertices. And if it finds that there's a vertex that isn't marked, it runs DFS on that vertex. So you just take that same idea and apply it right here. So if you do that, you end up actually getting it so that you can, you can actually touch, well, touch or mark every vertex in the graph. But yeah, so you just essentially have one other method that calls this one, or like for talking about DFS, you'd run it on each one separately. But I will point out that that does not change the time complexity, which is very interesting. The main reason why, like I said last day, is that we never really touch upon things that are in other parts of the graph, except of course in adjacency matrix, we read the whole row, but it doesn't make any difference for the time complexity. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll let you think about that one. Wonderful question. 
yeah, so that's all I have to say about applications of DFS, except I want to point out a very important property. So last day I showed you about cycle detection. So just remember, if you ever find yourself having a back edge after you run DFS or even while you're running DFS, I showed you a, a pseudocode for doing this in the notes. Uh, so there, that you can also do with DFS quite effectively. But I want to point out a very important property of DFS. So let me just move on over to this board over here. So I want to talk about one, I would consider this one of these very important properties that you should be aware of about DFS. So if you notice this, this is something that you can take advantage of when you're solving certain problems. In fact, some algorithms use this as a backbone for how they work. And this property is typical of graph traversal algorithms. But I want to point out something called a DFS tree. So it means de depth first search tree. So as we've seen, as we've seen, uh, DFS U, so remember this is DFS where it labels and marks all the vertices and edges. Sorry edges and vertices, respectively, um, starting from some vertex U. All the edges and vertices in a connected component, in a connected component, Uh, containing containing vertex u. So right, that's what DFS u will do. So I want you to notice this very important property. Notice that that the discovery edges. Sometimes I call these forward edges. Just be aware of that fact. Discovery forward edges form a tree. And we call this, this is called a DFS tree. So just as an example, so suppose I have this graph here, A, C, D, B, and E. Okay. So when I do DFS from, say, vertex A, suppose I visit the vertices in this manner. So suppose I marked a vertex, then I went over here, then I marked a vertex, I went I go here, I mark the vertex, I go here, and then you'll notice, oh, I mark this vertex, but that's, this isn't a discovery edge, that is what we call, what would we call this kind of edge here? What is that called? Starts with a B. Starts with a B. A back edge, exactly. So this is indeed a back edge. So we don't proceed to A. Then, so that means that we're done here. We go back this way, and suppose it goes this way. I mark that vertex. Of course, this is labeled as a discovery or forward edge. Then, of course, this gets labeled as a back edge. Now, take a look at all of the green edges as I put the red, the wrong cap on this marker. That was pretty epic. Hey, so what do the green edges look like? So these green edges, this is our DFS tree. So it's a tree. It always will be a tree. So, so green edges are discovery. Discovery edges form a tree. They form a tree. So just remember that. That's a very important property of DFS. 
So like I'm saying, you will need to know this. This is like really important. <laughs> um, so this property is very helpful for us when we're designing algorithms on graphs. So the other graph traversal method also does have this pro property as well, but it actually has some other properties too. So I want to point out just a couple of quick definitions. So if G is connected, G is connected, the DFS tree is a spanning, is a spanning subgraph, a spanning subgraph of G. That's a fancy name for, I'm going to define it in a moment. In particular, a spanning tree, a spanning tree, don't worry, I'll get out of your way in a moment, a spanning tree comprised of discovery edges, right? So I just want to tell you what these two things mean, the spanning subgraph. So a spanning subgraph A spanning subgraph. This is a not necessarily connected uh, subgraph. So note that it's not necessarily su connected. A subgraph H that contains that contains contains all the vertices vertices of G. So if I give you some graph G, the spanning subgraph will consist of all of the vertices of G. That's what spanning means. And you might naturally ask, okay, well, what's a spanning tree then? So naturally a spanning tree is just simply a spanning subgraph that's a tree, right? Um, a spanning subgraph. H, that is a tree. Wonderful. Wonderful. So just be aware of these two pieces of terminology. We'll be using that spanning tree one in the future. So just keep it in the back of your mind for future use. It's a stored in some variable and we'll use it later. <laughs> okay. So now I want to switch gears. We're going to talk about the other graph traversal algorithm. And depending on how far along we get here, I may get you to read a little bit beyond this. So let's proceed to talking about the next graph traversal algorithm. So we've talked about depth first search. And remember, depth first search, the whole idea in depth first search was that we take this depth wise approach. We just kind of go head in to the, to the graph, right? And we just bring a string, a bowl of thread with us just to make sure we don't lose our place. And we mark vertices and label edges, right? There's another way we could go about this. So instead of it being where I go depth wise, I go breadth wise. So we're going to talk about what we call breadth first search, which is that's essentially the approach that is taken. And believe it or not, it actually doesn't have much difference when it comes to data structures. So you just kind of change out a few data structures and you actually end up getting one or the other with some small tweaks to it. So just as an example, I just want to draw you a fun picture. So imagine I'm in some jungle. I'm in deep in some jungle. And being me, I'm just kind of in the middle of nowhere and I'm just like, oh, I'm having a good time. And suppose I'm looking for a place. It's way out here in the jungle. So I'm going to call it the Lost Temple of Awesome. So suppose this is me right here. I'm this little dot. I that insignificant. So I'm going to go on a little exploration in this deep jungle. I need to make sure I put my fancy hat on. That's how you know you're some explorers. You need to always wear a hat. That's what always I'm told. That's all the training you need. I, I'm kidding, of course. Uh, I don't recommend just wearing a hat, okay? Uh, hat is very helpful, but I don't think it gives you much more than just that, okay? So 
Suppose that I want to, so this is some jungle way out in here. And I want to get from here to there, but I don't know where the Lost Temple of Awesome is. There's a whole bunch of trees everywhere. Now, there's a couple of ways I could go about this, at least. Now, suppose that there's a bunch of pathways that I could take. Just, this is for just point of discussion. And suppose that, I don't know, maybe it meets like this and there's the temple right there. Like I said, it's a lost temple of awesome. Where do you think you get the awesomeness from? It's, it's always hiding in here. But don't, don't plunder or anything. You just come and enjoy it, okay? They have the best TV shows on. <laughs> so, what I could do, so one approach I could take is the depth first search kind of approach where I just kind of run head first into this jungle and cross my, I make sure I don't run into anything that has lots of teeth. <laughs> so I could do that or I could get lost in this jungle, but most certainly at some point, assuming I have enough resources, I could get over there, right? So I could follow one of these paths, take it as, as far deep as possible into this, into this, this forest, right? Or jungle. Now, Another way is instead of that, I'm going to mark, mark my starting point. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be a little bit more clever about this, is I'm going to take incremental approaches towards the Lost Temple of Awesome. Now, you imagine I had my ball of string. Remember in that, in depth for search, I just take it and I, I just use it to help me find my way back, right? Well, here, instead, what I would like to do is have, imagine I have a big peg and I put it in the ground. And what I would like to do is I would like to have my string so I can unwind it for about maybe one, I'm gonna say a set of steps. Say maybe like a foot or two, or maybe a couple meters. And then what I do is I check everything around my perimeter for that full two meters. And if I don't find anything, I expand my search out that way. So I take a coordinated approach where what I do, is I imagine I put a, a peg into the ground and maybe I take one step towards and around like this. And when I don't find anything yet, or maybe there's more to explore, I take another equally spaced out exploration around along any path that I can take that could take me from somewhere to another place. So I'll be able to go say about this far. So. Same idea, I could take another step. If I don't see anything new on my pathways, I'm gonna keep exploring down those paths that certain length. And I could keep doing this until I reach, Oops. sorry, my arms aren't long enough. I, I don't have that power. I'm only finite, okay? <laughs> so, so, so if I make the next step forward, I can get to this lost temple of awesome, right? So I'm taking a, so what some people call this a breadth width or breadth wise. Approach of exploring the jungle to find the lost temple of awesome. So instead of me just going head first into the jungle along one of these paths, I'm just gonna try to uncover more and more of the paths. <laughs> no, thank you. But no, the, I just do what I do. I'm having a good time here. Hope you're having a good time too. The, um, so every time I expand out by one, notice that every time I make one of these inches, I get myself a little closer over there, but there's gonna be some special properties that Breath First Search has because of this. So just keep that picture in mind where every time I make a step, you wanna think about those steps as a number of edges that I use to get to the next part of the graph. So that's gonna be what Breath First Search is going to be about. Now you might ask, so next day I will talk more about Breath First Search, uh, but so just don't worry, I'm not gonna ask you to read anything. Um, so like I said, Depth First Search is depth wise. Breath First Search, surprisingly, you remember Depth First Search was tied intimately with a stack, right? We had the call stack that we took advantage of and all of our applications, we use stacks, right? You might ask, okay, well, what data structure is intimately tied with Breath First Search? Well, think about it. If I have a stack, that's what allows me to keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. Another way you can look at this is every time I make an explore, an ex, a next step in this, if I uncover anything new, the order in which I do that should go naturally into a queue. So, so 
So it's related to using a Q. So we're going to use a Q for our breath burst search. So what I'm going to do is because I have two more minutes, I'm going to give you the pseudo code for breath first search. Then we come back, we'll do an example and then summarize a couple of neat things with breath first search. So if you don't have time to write down the pseudo code, that's OK. We'll come back to it next time. So just make sure you just come come early because uh, I'm going to talk about some things that the breath first search tree. Sorry, the breath first search hack is capable of doing. So let me just quickly write this down. And you're going to see that it has striking similarities to that first search. It's just the data structure is a little different. And I'm going to add some more to this next time. So if you're wondering um, when you're doing this, don't worry. I'm going to put this back on the board next time. So if you find yourself having to go somewhere, uh, don't worry. I'm going to come right back to this next day. So let me write this down quickly. So here's the input. So the input is going to be a vertex huge. So just like with DFS, I'll just walk us through the pseudocode here. I must stress that the pseudocode you're going to find on the notes are going to be based on the what we're going to do next time, OK? So there might be a few things that I'm going to add in afterwards to this. But I just kind of want to walk us through this quickly. So we're going to do a BFS traversal of G starting at U. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to initialize an empty queue. So I'm going to start off with an empty queue. Which is your best friend. We're going to put vertices into this queue. And I'm going to start off by enqueuing or entering. So we want to enqueue. We're going to enqueue the starting vertex. And then we're going to do a process that's just like DFS. We're going to mark. We're going to mark U. And then while, so quite similar to this, it's going to be while Q is not empty. So while the Q has at least one vertex in it, while it's not empty, you're going to dump out the element, so our, our vertices out of the Q one after the other. And we're going to see if we can explore more of the graph this manner. So you just simply just take view, V, V, and you're going to DQ. Remember, this will give you just the next available vertex. And then you do some process. So this would be where you're visiting the vertex. So this would just be saying do something. So you just do something here. You can do whatever you want there. I'm, I'm just saying that you just do something right here. And then what you do is you're just simply going to consider for every Every edge VW, you're going to do the following. So it's going to be very similar to the setup with, with DFS. I'm just going to write the rest up here. So for every one of the incident edges, you're just going to check if if VW is not labeled. So if the edge is not labeled, you're going to do the following. If it's not labeled, then you just ask if W if W is marked. If it is marked, then you're going to label it. Now, the thing that's going to be a little different about BFS is that you're going to label the edges that they aren't going to be back edges. They're going to be what we call cross edges. There's a difference between the two. Label VW as cross edge. I apologize, I'm going a little bit over here. Hopefully this is understandable. I'm just gonna just finish copying this down. So I have a cross edge. Otherwise, this is where we're gonna repeat our process again. But remember, I'm taking advantage of the fact we have a queue. So I'm just gonna enqueue in what I haven't found, haven't included yet, which is just I'm gonna enqueue W in. So I'm going to label. So this is where I'm gonna label the discovery edge. Label VW as discovery edge. So we just label VW as the discovery edge. 
And then I'm going to NQ in W. So I go Q dot NQ. NQ W. And then I'm just going to mark W because I need some mechanism to make sure I can mark them. And that's, I think that's everything I've got here. So let's see. So I got else if I'm just making sure I got all my braces in the right spots. Else if, and I think I have the while loop out there. And that's everything. That's, that's BFS. So when we come back next day, I'll be going through more detail about how we can, how this BFS works. And then we'll be seeing how some properties that BFS has. So I'll be bringing this back up next day. So I want to mostly walk this through so that way I could, don't have to go into that detail again next time. So that being said, I want to say thank you very much and have yourself a beautiful day. I'll see you later. And thank you very again for your time. So I'll see you later. Yeah. <laughs>